Fenomena To the living God No one can deny That Jesus Christ Put your hands together for that video. Angelo's doing an outstanding job with, with his ministry of, of helping to, to bring these videos to us so that he can, yeah, give him a hand. Yeah. I, I, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a heavy responsibility on him, um, but it also is a good thing for us because it requires us to kind of talk about the sermon and talk through the sermon and he's actually listening to me and then he's going out and trying to find these videos and he does a he does a wonderful job Angela we're so thankful for you yeah we're thankful for you man all right so last week we started a brand new sermon series we went through this entire series on love I think it was 16 weeks I know we went through every single adjective that Paul uses to explain what love is we, we, we grapple with the question, you know, if, if we were loving enough. And we got through that whole series, and that series really convicted, I think, me and I think many of the people who were here for those sermons because it gave us a different view of love. And, and as I began to kind of study and go through that series, it, it became clearer to me exactly why Jesus and, and Paul and, and the disciples were so focused on love. And the reason is because of, of this great commission. And so I want to read this with you real quick. We started this new series called Go, and it comes out of the great commission, Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. In particular, verses 19, it says, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then Jesus commanded them, and us to go and make disciples of all nations. And so just to make sure that everybody, because I know it might be easy to think that Jesus was just talking to this group of probably 70 disciples total. We generally talk about the 12. Those are the ones that we know the most about. But, but historians have kind of come to the place, and there's a, there's a couple places when, when Jesus says he sent them out. And it's somewhere around 70. It may have been a little less, a little more present for this command. But, but, but this was not just about these 70 or so people at all. But, but this was about us. That, that when Jesus came out of the grave, and his goal was to save us, the entire world. He wanted to conquer death everywhere it is, conquer the grave everywhere it is. He wanted to bring as many people as he could to his Father, to heaven. That the plan that, that he came up with, this is the plan that Jesus and God came up with, is that each one of us would go out and tell people what they call the good news. That their sins have been forgiven, that, that, they, that they're going to go to heaven and meet God one day, and all that is the result of Jesus dying on the cross. Amen. And I got to thinking about that this week. I, I just think about this for a second. Of 70 people, around about 70 people, give or take a few, that went out and talked to other people. And then they went out and talked to other people. And then that just kept happening for, for hundreds of thousands of years, for over 2,000 years. And eventually, one of those people talked to, to me. Isn't that amazing how that plan works? I, I'm, I'm blown away. It would, it would make me feel so happy. Now, this is the amazing part for me. If I could just figure out which one of those 70 was the one who went and talked to somebody that ultimately led back to me. Because all of us in this room come from one of those 70 so people. You know Christ today because they talked to somebody and eventually it got to you. Think about that for a minute. Think of how amazing that is. Now, now, now here's the part that's even more amazing. Who's going to come to Christ because of you? If 70 people could touch billions of people, think about this. Billions today, billions of people are, are Christians because of these 70 people. 
What is the impact of you and your evangelism and the people that you go out and touch? What is going to be your contribution? How many billions of people are going to go to heaven for what you're doing right now? This is not about growing the church. Not uplift anyway. This is about each one of you. And remember, this is the question that we're taking through this whole series. It, basically, the question is, can God trust you with with his, with his assignment for you. God, God says to us that it is our job to go. Listen, it's not anybody else's job. It's not the guy on the TV's job. It's not my job as a pastor. It's not your mom's job, your dad's job. It is your job. We talked last week. It is your responsibility. It is your mission. And, and trust me, guys, it is your purpose. And you will always have some emptiness. You'll always be missing something. You'll never be able to put. You have food in the cupboard. You have a job with security. You have money in your pocket. Kids will be well. And you'll always have this feeling, what is my purpose? What am I here for? There are 500,000 books written on purpose. Because all of us are seeking for, for that one thing. What is my purpose? And, and the answer is, is for you to go. And when you add go into whatever you're doing, I don't care if you're a teacher if you're an engineer, when you add go and tell people about Jesus, when you're sitting at church and you see that person that you invited get themselves to Christ, when you see those tears start to roll down, there is no better feeling. That, the car that you got that made you feel good but started to depreciate the day you drove it off the lot, and then by the time you got finished paying for it, you wanted to give it away because it was such a hassle. Yeah, that feeling's not good, that feels not good enough. The, the marriage that you thought was going to solve and bring all the happiness into your life? No, no, no. This feeling is even better than that. The children that you birthed, and we just had children to be birthed in this congregation, will never bring you the happiness and the purpose. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be a great mom. You'll be a great dad, sure. But the purpose that you get from winning souls for Christ, from doing the thing that you were created to do, is the only thing that's going to give you that, that wholeness. And if you're missing that today, if you're wondering what your purpose is, if you've got this feeling of emptiness, although things around you appear to be well, I, I, the challenge of this series is to get you to go and, and become comfortable with making disciples. And we talked last week, God's not calling you to be the judge. You're not supposed to go and tell people that they're going to hell, that they're wrong. That is not what we're doing. We've, we've had enough of that. That's over with. We don't want that anymore. And you don't want it and you don't want to talk to anybody about it and you don't want to talk to people like that. And you're not in any way supposed to be the defender. Only the Holy Spirit can defend Jesus. But what you've been called to be is a witness, and that's it. You've just been called to be a witness, just like the song said. You, you've been called to go around and tell people about a way maker. You know how you know he's a way maker? Because you were in a position where you needed a way made. And all Jesus wants to do, all evangelism is about, is you going and tell people about a God that made a way when you needed a way made. That's how easy it is. All it is is, is you going to tell somebody about a God who kept a promise to you. Things didn't look like it was going to happen. It didn't look like you were going to get the thing that God promised you. It didn't look like you were going to get the family. It didn't look like you was going to have the house. It didn't look like you was going to have whatever it is. And then God showed up and, and proved to you that he was a promise keeper. Evangelism is about going out and telling somebody that although it's dark right now in my life, although it's, it's dark, I've been through some dark times in my life. I know you feel like it's a very dark time for you, but, but I was in the dark. And, and, and this God, this, this God, his Holy Spirit, his son Jesus has come into my life and, and, and he brought light with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and, and my situation was dark. I'm talking about it was so dark that I couldn't see in front of me. But, but then I gave my life to Christ, and that is evangelism. That's what it's about. And all of us are capable of doing that because, let me tell you something, this is, this, is the, this is the wonderful thing about evangelism. It doesn't have anything to do with how smart you are, how old you are, how much money you have. It doesn't have anything to do with where you live. It doesn't have anything to do with what family you come from. Evangelism is just about one thing. It's about you having the willingness to do what is in God's will. 
Evangelism is about one thing and one thing only. You're capable. You're equipped. You have everything that you need to go out and tell people what God has already done for you and what you expect God to do for you. You don't have to read another book. You don't have to learn another language. You don't have to do anything else except for go and talk to people about Christ. So this week, and I, I, know, I know everybody is excited about evangelism, but I also know that you're cautious about it because we've gotten to this place. I'm 43 years old, and I didn't understand what evangelism was, and I'm a pastor. And so if I'm in the Bible every week reading, praying, meditating on this, but I've got 43 years of people telling me evangelists are this group of people that go out, not you. you we've got an evangelist team for that. That's not you. That, that's not your responsibility. That your responsibility is just to come and volunteer, pay tithes, and then go back home. And if somebody needs you along the way, maybe get them something or see somebody with, with, with something on the side of the road. You can put some, that's, that's the Christian thing to do. But it's bigger than that. You have been called to share your witness. And, and that's, that's the plan. There is no plan B. There is not going to be, in, when, when plan B kicks in, it's over. When, when, when you see angels come down from heaven, it's over. When you, the earthquakes won't go away, the growing pains and all that stuff in the Bible, when that stuff starts, it's over. Our goal is to get as many people. This is our mission, guys. When you joined Uplift, when you became part of Uplift, this is what you signed up for. We're going to get as many people as we possibly can to Christ so that he can do what? Draw them. So he can save as many people as he can. And so this week, because I know we all want to get to the place where we can do this, and I know we haven't been trained to do this, and, and trust me, Bridget is taking over evangelism for us. Bridget is working now to get training in place. You're going to be trained and equipped, but you need to understand, you've got everything that you need right now. The thing that's missing, the reason why you're not doing it now is just will. You, you've been given an assignment from the boss, from the king. And every day you're making a decision whether or not you're going to do it. You are making a decision daily whether or not you're going to do the thing God told you. Now, how crazy is that? And when you decide, no, I'm not going to tell anybody about you. But, but, but I told you to go tell. When you decide, no, I'm not going to make this my mission, even though you told me I was born to do this. When you go and tell God that I'm not going to do the one thing you created me to do, th there's got to be a consequence for that. And so this week, because I, I don't think anybody wants to be in this place anymore. I don't think there's a person in here who doesn't want to be able to go out and tell people about Jesus. Matter of fact, I think that there are people in here who've always wanted to do it. But you just never felt like you could do it. And what this series is going to do, this series is going to prepare you. I'm, we're going to take down all the, the, the foolishness. And we talked last week about the evangelist with the white shoes and the tents and all that stuff. The person yelling at you, you're going to hell. All that stuff. None of it's real. We're tearing down all that stuff. We're going we're to show you how, young man, young lady, how you can just sit down with your friends, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, 12, 15, 16. You can still be the cool kid and tell people about how good God is. And guess what? They want to know. They're struggling with all types. Of, that's why they're acting out in class because they're struggling with all types of insecurities and confusion. And the one thing that they need more than anything else, young people, is to know that there's a rock that they can stand on that when society and social media and whatever it is that's coming against them comes against them, that there's a God that they can stand on that no matter what happens, he's going to always be their friend. He's going to like them, thumbs up to them. And so this week, I want us just to focus on going out and praying for everyone. Go and pray for everyone. That's what we need. That's what we need from this church. That's what we need from every single person in here. Go and pray for everyone. And so what happens is uh, Paul has to go away. He, he gets arrested. He's gone for, for like three years. And the church in Ephesus is going through all types of issues. And so Paul's kind of left a person in charge. He's not a pastor per se. He's kind of in charge of all the pastors. He'd be more like a bishop, kind of in charge of, of everybody at the church. And th this guy's name is Timothy. This is a really good, good guy. And, and Paul has poured 
into Timothy, poured into Timothy so that Timothy could go and help keep every, everybody together, understand exactly what the church should be doing and, and, and explaining how to grow the church and keep the church together. Some of you guys know that when you're growing, sometimes it's hard to keep it together. Some marriages know what I'm talking about. As you grow, sometimes it's hard to keep it together. Some kids, you know what I'm talking about. As you get bigger and better at things in sports, you get a lot of pressure on you because sometimes it's hard for you to go out and perform at the same level and you feel like mom and dad are looking at me and if I'm not able to perform, I'm growing now. I'm, I'm, I'm achieving at a higher level. When I was this big and I was kicking the ball, it was wonderful, right? Because if I kicked it down the hill, nobody really cared. They laughed and they had a good time. And now mama is over there, not even dad. And mama's over there saying, kick it right here. Why did you kick it like that? Right here? And, and sometimes as we begin to grow, and that's what the church was experiencing. And listen, Uplift, we're not exempt from that. As we continue to grow, we're going to grow. We will have challenges that we're going to have to overcome and, and, and that we're going to have to overcome. And what he's saying today is, is through prayer. And so Paul writes this letter, sends it back. He can't go. Imagine this now. Paul sends this letter from the jail. He's in jail. He sends this letter. He trusts it, gives it to somebody. Somebody walks it, rides, maybe rides a donkey or a horse or something like that. Most people wouldn't have had a lot of horses. That would have been for rich people. So he gets this. Letter all the way to Timothy. And, and what Paul is communicating to Timothy is the keys to evangelism. And let, let's just read a little bit of it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He says, first of all, before I say anything else, first of all, you, we, I don't have to explain that too much. He says, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life. God knows right now all we need is a little peace. I don't care what you're going through right now. If God could interject, that's, that's part of your prayer. It's got to be that God would interject peace. Because no matter what you're going through in your life, if you could just have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, wouldn't it just be a little bit better right now? Matter of fact, I'm praying over you. Peace. Somebody needs peace right now, and I'm praying right now that the God uh, uh, that we serve with, with power that su surpasses anything we could ever understand would allow for his peace to be over you. It says, so, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants, what does he want? everyone to be saved. That is the goal. That's the whole reason why he allowed his son to die, to be beaten, to be humiliated, to be spat on, to be flogged, to, to go into hell. Literally, he died, went into hell, and then he went down into hell and pulled his own son out. That is the whole plan. The plan, that, that part of the plan is to do one thing, and that is that everyone can be saved. That's all he wants. Because God is the creator, he created every single person here. You got to understand that, that there's not a person that God didn't create. And just like you, everything you create, it doesn't matter what it is, you want it to live. And so God created you. He created you to be in relationship with him. He created unbelievers, and he created them to be in relationship with him. He created uh, uh, devil worshipers, and he created them to be in relationship with him. He created everybody, and he wants them to be in relationship with them, and he wants them to be saved. He wants them to know and accept Christ into their hearts, to, to put God first in their lives, to be saved, and to come through the knowledge of the truth. And the truth is that there's one God, he goes a little bit further and talks about this. There's his son, Jesus Christ, who's our mediator, who died on the cross, and that when we accept him, repent of our sins, accept him, we're saved. Now, now, the thing about these four verses and I, that I want to draw you close to is that God gives us, through Paul, the goal. And the goal is that everybody be saved. That's what we hear. The same thing he told Jesus to tell us, go out and save everybody. Go everywhere you can. Go to the ends of the earth. Tell everybody about it. It's the same goal that he has here. He's saying, I want everybody to be saved. But he says, the way that you do that Stars with what? Prayer. 
First of all, before you do anything toward going out and saving anybody, toward talking to anybody, toward trying to lead anybody to Christ, the first thing we've got to learn how to do is to pray. And, and so what I want to do is I want to rip that first verse apart just a little bit. Let's look at it real quick. He starts out by saying, first of all, and he used this word, urge. He says, first of all, then I urge. And, and these, are, these are two Greek words. This first word is very familiar to you. This first word is proton. I can pronounce that one. And, and proton means exactly what it, what it looks like it means. It means exactly what it means in science. It is the first property. It's the center of the atom. It is the proton. But, but he adds this piece to it, this word urge, which is para uh, kalo. And, and, and what he is now doing, check this out. He is now saying to us, that the first thing that we do when we want to evangelize, literally the first thing from a sequence perspective, like the first thing you do is you pray. But, but he's also saying, because he puts his word urge with it, that the first thing that we do and the most important thing that we can do in the whole process of evangelizing anybody is to pray. He said, start with prayer and understand that your prayers are the thing that's going to happen because it won't be your eloquence. It won't be the, the necessarily the time that you show up or when you show up. All those things factor in. But the thing that's moving, that, that's making it possible for anybody to grasp this, 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 this Christian religion, is the Holy Spirit. And he's saying before we start out doing anything, before we start buying flyers and before we it won't matter what flyer what sign you put up those signs people drive by they'll never see it unless God speaks to their heart they won't be at the door today you knock on the door unless God tells them hey go back home I think you left the iron on and they go back home and you knock on the door at the same time but but that all starts with prayer let's look at how this word is is used in scripture uh, let's look let's look a little bit further at these words so he says not only uh, first of all, then I urge you, but, but he begins to pull out some specific types of prayers. And, and I don't think in any way Paul is saying that these are the only prayers that we need to pray. But I think what Paul is showing us is a pattern of types of prayers that we need to pray in order to go out and be effective in evangelism. The first one he shows us is a, is a petition. And, and in the Greek, this word deasis uh, is a request to God, and it's based on the sense of, of, of some deep spiritual or physical need, is you going to God and saying, listen, I cannot do this without you. Whether it be physical, I, I, I can't pay this bill, or I don't have any way to do this job, I, I need you, or whether it's spiritual, I can't get rid of this addiction, I, I, I need you, God, you are the only way, you are the way maker. This word, this word means to, to act with urgency. So, so you're not just coming to, to pray this type of prayer because you need uh, some physical or spiritual. But you're in a position to where you're going to get kicked out of the house at the end of this month. You got to have a payment. And, and so you coming to God and you're saying, God, listen, I need a way maker. You need a miracle. I got this cancer in my body. They're telling me I don't have but a few months. I need you. I need you to move now. That's what this kind of pray is. And, and, and for us, we've got to kind of be looking out and praying for this community and praying that the Holy Spirit would, would move in this community. We've got to take specific. That's, that's one thing about petitions. They're more specific. They're not general. They're saying, God, we've got a problem in this community with, with an addiction. And we're asking you, God, to go inside of every house Tear down that addiction. Get, give power over the enemy for, for this addiction. Hebrews 5 and 7, he says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with, with, with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. That's what we got to pray. We got to pray understanding that it won't be about a sign that we buy. It won't be about our time, our eloquence, the way that we talk, the way that we look. None of that stuff will mean a hill of beans. The only thing that's going to help us go out and evangelize and touch this community and help in the healing process of this community, whether it be physical, spiritual, 
or mental is God. Let's go a little bit further. He says, uh, not only that should we be praying these petitions, but, but we ought to be doing these general prayers. And, and this word that's used in the Greek, it is just that, just general prayers. It's just you communicating with God all the time, us as a church communicating with God all the time. The only time we talk to God shouldn't be when we have a petition, but we ought to be talking to God all the time, everywhere we go. You're driving down the street, talking to God, having a conversation with God. You're at home, having a conversation with God. In the midst of your day at work, you ought to be having a conversation with God. This is a very general word, a very general kind of prayer. You're not going to God and saying, hey, I need X, Y, and Z. I need the bills paid. I need, I need these other things done. But you're just talking in general to him. God, you're my father. This is a thank you for this sun. Wow, this thing's beautiful. You made it. Look, look at these beautiful trees. You, you, you designed every one of them by hand. You, you painted this entire landscape that we, that, we, that we enjoy every day. You're God. How do we see this in, in Scripture? In Acts 2, it says, And they, talking about the first church, Devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And, and then they talk a lot about what happened in the, the next couple of verses. And then you get down to the end and you see how this prayer thing works as far as going out and evangelizing. It says, and every day, verse 47, the Lord added to them those who were being what? Saved. That's what your general prayers do. That's what it means when you have a connection with God and you, you're talking to him throughout the day for your family, for your community, for your life, and you're just constantly in, in communication with him. As we look at the life of Jesus, it wasn't anything for him to be gone somewhere behind a rock, behind a tree. Just general prayers. Just talking to the Father. Just having a relationship with God. Let's go a little bit further. He says, Petitions, prayers, and also intercessions. He, he talks about this, this, this prayer where it is much more specific. Like, you are literally saying, for this person, I need you to do this. It, it, it is, uh, the Greek word here is entiosis, and it is to speak to someone on behalf of another. I'm going to somebody else. You're the one in trouble. Sloan will sometimes do this for Angelo. Angelo will sometimes do this for Sloan. You're the one in trouble, but I'm going to go talk to Dad. And, and I'm going to see if I can, you know, get some favor, get him to be rational about this. I think two years is too long to be punished. I think that if I can just go to him and say, hey, not, not, not two years. Come on, Dad, not two years. That's too long. All he did was then make his bed up. This is what Jesus is doing for us. He's, he's our mediator. He's always going to the Father. And just like with anything else, we want to do what we see Jesus doing. So through Scripture, we see Jesus praying for us, and he's going in, and he's mediating for us. He's interceding for us. And so that's what we need to do. You need to create a specific list of those people in your life that need Jesus. Don't guess if they know Jesus. Don't guess if they've given their life to Christ. You would be surprised. I've been at churches where when a person walked up and gave their life to Christ, they've been sitting there for 15, 20 years. I thought it was a deacon. I'm like, you, don't, you, you haven't accepted Christ? How does this look in the Scripture? Luke 22, this is Jesus uh, talking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. I pray that, that your faith may not fail, and you, when you have turned back, that you'll be able to strengthen everybody else. That's what, that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is interceding. He's saying, listen, I realize that you're up against this challenge. I realize what the enemy is trying to do in your life, but I need you to know that I prayed for you, and my prayer, very specific, I'm praying for you for this situation, and my prayer is that God will give you faith and that, that, that you won't fail and that when you get through this, that God will use your testimony in order to change the world, evangelize even more. That's what I'm praying. Let's go a little bit further. It gets to this prayer called Thanksgiving. 
And sometimes we don't even consider when we're being thankful to God as a prayer. But listen, we have to get to a place where we incorporate more of thanksgiving into our prayers. So many of our prayers are so self-centered and they're so forward-looking. And they never acknowledge the fact that God has been good already. Like, you don't have to do anything else, God. You have been so good to me. The fact that you woke me up this morning, listen to me. It's enough for me to pray to you and praise you through my prayers. And, and what Paul is saying to us is that we've got to get to a place where we're just not praying, God, give me, God, help me, God, provide for me, God, open this door. But thank you, God. If you don't open the door, I'm okay with that because you've been so, so good to me. And I'm going to trust that the reason why you didn't open the door is because there's something behind that door that's going to hurt me even more. And I'm going to be okay with that because I am thankful. And this word, it, this Greek word, it just simply means to be thankful, to have gratitude. You know, a lot of things... You know, there are a lot of things that get under my skin, but nothing gets under my skin more than a person uh, that's not thankful. My, my kids can do a lot of things that will upset me. Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. But whenever I see them not being thankful, uh, it just does something to me. And listen, as a church... We've got to be thankful. We've got to be thankful for every single person that's here. Listen, I'm telling you right now, I thank God for every single one of you. God put you here. You're not here because of anything that I've done or anything this church has done. We don't deserve for you to be here. You, 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 I, I, you're not ours. You're not mine. You're God's. And the fact that God thought enough about me to answer my prayer I'm just thankful that he sent you. I'm thankful that you're here today. I'm thankful that we've in encountered each other on this journey. And as long as you are here, I'm thankful. And when God calls you to go somewhere else or, 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 or pulls you in another direction, or even if you go on your own, I'm just thankful for the time that I've had with you. I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be your pastor. I'm just thankful to be able to experience life with you, to be able to walk through life, to learn from you, to be blessed by you, to have been prayed for by you, to be trusted enough to sit down with you and your families and your children. You trust me enough to believe that I don't want to hurt you. All I want to do is give you what God has given to me. And I thank God for that. And I thank you for it too. I thank you for your sacrifices that you've made to this ministry, the time sacrifices, being here on Saturday evenings when you could be doing whatever it is. And I'm not talking about bad stuff. Just be at home resting. But you're here on a beautiful day today. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for what you've done for my children, for what you've done for my wife. I'm thankful for the beautician that did her beautiful hair. I'm thankful. I'm thankful, guys. And listen, when we get to this place, let, let me tell you what flees from this. When you start thinking like this, when you start talking like this, when, you, when your inner ear starts hearing your voice, not somebody else's voice, saying to you, your voice saying to you that you are thankful for God, depression goes out the window. Resentment goes out the window. Envy, jealousy, all those things, they can't exist. You can't. You can't have them in the same place. When you're thankful for what God has given you, it's hard for you to be jealous for what somebody else got. Amen. How does this look in the Scripture? Ephesians 1, 15 and 16, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, ever since you came to Uplift, ever since you gave your, your, your hand to the church, ever since you've given your heart to God, ever since you came to the faith and understanding of Jesus, and your love for all the people. I have not stopped. Paul says, I have not stopped. That means that Paul is in a jail cell giving thanks for people who are free and, and out doing stuff. But he says, I can't stop. Even in this cell, I'm tied to an officer 24 hours a day. I have no privacy. The person above me, there's no plumbing. So whatever he's doing upstairs is literally dripping down into my cell. My life is terrible, but I am I'm so thankful that God saved you. And, and uplift as a family. When we treat people that way, you won't be able to stop. This place will be full. We'll we go knock on doors with an army 
We'll, we'll be able to touch lives like never before. When people realize that the thing that we're in it for is to, is, is to save lives and that we're thankful for the opportunity that we've been given to do that in this area, he could have chose anybody else. He chose us. We're thankful. He says, for, for you, he says, remembering you in, in my prayers. And we've got to get to a place where we thank God for every single thing that happens in our prayers. Thank him for everybody he's put in your life, in your prayers. Do not allow for your prayers to be just about you. You know what else will happen if you do this? You'll pray more. You're tired of hearing yourself ask for stuff. You're sick of it. I'm not saying God's sick of it. I can't speak for him. But you're sick of it, hearing yourself asking for the same thing over again, hearing yourself talking about you all the time. You're not, you're not designed that way. Let's go a little bit further. He says, puts the whole thing, kind of puts it back together. He says, now, I need you to pray. I need you to have these specific praise, prayers. But, 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 but I need you also to understand that these prayers are for Everyone. So, so while we're going through the process of doing these supplications and, and, and these prayers and these intercessions, you got to pray for, for everyone. Now, check this out. He goes a little bit further. He says, kings and all those who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And I want you to understand that because that's in there for a reason. Everything in this Bible is in there for a reason. And you need to understand that the persons that would have been persecuting Paul would have been the kings and the authority. So during this time, unlike what we're used to, it wasn't fun to be a Christian. What, what, what did being a Christian get you? Persecution. What did that look like? Somebody fired you? No, 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 no. That looked like you're being fed to a beast. What did that look like? Somebody uh, uh, putting negative rumors out about you? No, that looked like you being tied up in a leather bag up to your head where your arms couldn't get out and you were being thrown into water and drowning. What did that look like? People not, people putting bad things on social media? No, 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 no. That looked like you being in the king's garden covered in oil and set on fire. That's what it looked like. We don't even have a clue and we still don't want to go out. And you need to understand this. The folks still went out and told people about Jesus even though they knew. You are here today because somebody who probably got burned at the stake. You are here today because of somebody who probably got fed to a beast. You are here today because of somebody who probably drowned. And we won't even go out and tell anybody. And, and, and there's no, nobody's going to do any of that to you today. At least not now. But, but, but the Bible says there'll come a time when, when we'll be persecuted again. We'll go through stuff again. But, but as of now, the only thing that's stopping you from going out and doing this is you. It's you. The opportunity is there. God is, he's putting that opportunity around you. There are people in your lives. There are even young people. There are young people in your lives, guys, who you can speak to and, and tell them the good news, right? And the only thing that's stopping us from getting people to this peace and tranquility, the only thing that's stopping us from getting people to this, to leading a godly life and, and with dignity is us. That, that's one other thing that, that I want to implore you on, and that is, he says we pray for all kings. That means you got to pray for Trump like you pray for Obama. And this is where the, this kind of thing, this evangelism thing kind of, kind of takes us. This is what Paul is putting it in there. He wants you to think about it like this. Like, do you pray for Trump as much as you pray for Obama? And if not, what's stopping you? Do, do you pray for the Republicans as much as you pray for the Democrats? Republicans, do you pray for the Democrats as much as you pray for the Republicans? This is what he's trying to break. He's trying to get us out of this mentality where we choose a side based on something man created and we miss the save all. Do you know how I many folk are going to hell because you wouldn't stop what you were doing and talk to them because they didn't look like you or they were from another party or, or they were in another fraternity, another sorority, or they were another uh, race? That's foolishness. 
Why well, be praying even harder for the candidate that we don't like because that takes us out of it. When we pray even harder, we know that there's no me in this. I'm just praying hard as I ever prayed before. We're not praying. Now, listen now. Don't try to get slick with me and we're going to pray for him because he's terrible or we're going to pray for her because she's no good or whatever. <laughs> You're still there. You're still in the carnal place. I'm trying to raise you up to the spiritual place. We're going to pray for him because he's a leader, because he's a king, because Paul has told us, that we have to do this because it's the right thing to do because the only way that peace and tranquility is going to come into this land is that we pray. It's not a bunch of guys in, in Congress making decisions about war that's going to stop war. It's not a bunch of guys with suits on talking about feeding folk that's going to feed the folk. It's what's going to happen right here in this praying and in our evangelism. And when we get to the place as a church, even uplift, when we can pray and evangelize, we get rid of all that junk. We bring as many people as we can to Christ. So, let's go a little bit further. I want, I want you to just think about this because I, I need you this week. I need you all actually uh, going forward. But, but, but definitely this week I need you praying. Uh, let's say between now and October the 1st, I need you to incorporate these specific prayers into what you pray. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually send these out to you with the verses that go with them at, later, at a later time. But, but I need you praying, first of all, that the Father would draw all to Jesus, that we don't, we don't need to go out and find people, and we don't need to go in the, in the haystack looking for needles, but that God would draw. He has the power to draw. He's a magnet, that he would draw, that if we lift up Christ, that he will do what? All the drawing. I want you guys praying that the word of God would pierce their hearts. The word says that the, that the word is a double-edged sword, that it can cut through the spirit. It can separate. It can, it can cut through any issues, any bone, everything, marrow, everything. We, we want to pray that God's word become just that two-edged sword in this community. That, that when they read bumper stickers in this community, that it brings them to Christ. Hallelujah. I, I want you praying against the spirit that that blinds their minds. There's a spirit, Paul calls it the, 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 the God of this place. The, the, this is the devil, right? It's a spirit. There are all types of spirits throughout this, this area that we're going to be fighting against. And we want to pray that, the, that that spirit, that bad spirit, that the king of this place, that, that he doesn't have any authority in this place, but that God will come in and he'll send his angels and utterly, destroy the enemy during this time, that there be no spirit of constriction like people, I, I, I want to go, but I can't go. I got too much going on. That's a spirit. You, you're struggling with that sometimes. Spirit of busyness. I'm too busy to serve. I'm too busy to go out. The spirit of fear. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us power, love, and sound mind. I want you praying that they, being whoever it is, everybody, Come to know God relationally. Because when you come into this sonship, into this spirit of adoption is what the Bible talks about, it doesn't take for us going out having to prime a pump and, and beg for people to come. But when they get into a relationship with God, they'll come. They'll come knock on doors with us. And we're going to pray that the spirit of adoption go out heavy all throughout this area. Let's close this out. Look at this verse. Let's just put it back all together because we ripped it up. Let's put it back all together. Paul says to Timothy in four verses, he gives us everything that you need, I need, in order to go out and be an evangelist. It doesn't take any fancy stuff at all. We don't have to have big signs or anything like that. Paul gives us everything that we need. He says, first of all, then, I urge that pray from a place of supplication. You go specifically to God saying, hey, I can't do this without you. I need you to move that, that, that you stay in constant contact with God, that, that you intercede on behalf of those people, write you out a list of those people in your families, at work, all throughout the community, your neighbors, hallelujah. And, and be thankful. He says that we got to do that for everyone, for the kings. We got to do that for all of our authority. We've got to pray that, that tranquility and, and, and a quiet life and peace. We got to pray that this place become a place of, of, of God, that when people come to this side of town, they, that they sense the spirit of, of God and that there's dignity. And, and he says, now check this out. He says, this is good. 
and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You, you want to get closer to God? You feel like you're away from God? Evangelize. Because God has already told you, you don't have to try and figure out, should I be listening to this? Am, am I good with you, God? I'm listening to this. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this thing. Am I good with you, God? I'm, I'm, I'm coming, but I, I got this thing. Am I giving enough? I'm, you got all these questions around how you're supposed to live, how you're supposed to be disciple, how, you, how you're supposed to please God, and you're wondering, am I pleasing God? And what God says is, if you do this, if you pray, I'm pleased with that. Th that's all. That that's the first step to evangelism. All we have to do is pray, earnestly pray. That is all God is asking you to do. And here's the question. Will you pray? Will you take time to uh, pray in the way that he's asked us to? Will you, will you petition him for people? for yourself? Will you, will you pray? Will you just connect with him? Just talk to him all the time. Will, will you intercede for people? Classmates, young people, will you intercede for family members? Will you be thankful? Will, will you take time to let God know how, how thankful you are? Will, will you pray for peace in your house, in your family? It's not pray against people. You know, so many times, Families, we work curse ourselves. We work in witchcraft. We're talking about, I'm, I, you, you're saying stuff like, I wish that somebody teach him or I wish that somebody teach her. That's word curses. That's witchcraft. No, be thankful. Thank you, God, for, for whatever you're doing in my child's life, in my husband's life, my wife's life. Thank you, God, for the way you're moving in this job. Don't pray against your boss. Be thankful. And, and, and God is showing us through the writings of Paul that if we do this, that, that we become that first step of evangelism and that everyone around us begins. We can save people. We can get them there. They still have a decision to make, but we can go to bed at night knowing that we did everything that we were supposed to do. So I'm challenging you this week. I'm challenging you to think about this this week. I, I, I want you to talk with God about unbelievers. We're getting ready to go out into this community. We got a lot of people. They might go to church once a year, two times a year, three times a year. But we got to get to a place where we can get them into the church, and we got to get to a place where we can get them to going out and finding more people. And so what I want you guys to be focused on is I will talk to God about unbelievers before I talk to unbelievers about God. A very simple thing. I will pray before I go out and talk to anybody about God. Because I know that the only way that a real change can happen in this is that it be a God moment, that God moves. I want to challenge you this week. I want you just to, to, to get into a place where you just pray to God for unbelievers. Or you're just praying that, to God that he would move in this area, that he would soften the dirt, the soil in this area so that we can begin to plant like never before. To God be the glory. Jesus Christ.